would love it if, if hospitals were able to access all the medications they needed. I would love it if um, all of those people that have leadership titles of, you know, drug shortage manager or, um, you know, that work could all be challenged and uh, channeled, I mean, into other medication use activities that really help optimize care for patients. Um, I feel like drug shortages, while extraordinarily important to, to manage well for, for patient safety, it's, it's wasted work, honestly. I mean, we, if we had access to, to the medications we needed, uh, we, we could certainly funnel, funnel that work in, into a different way. You know, I, I, do, I do see positive changes on the horizon for shortages. It's a really good time for change. So um, I, I do hope that in the future, um, shortages will be a thing that we talk about that used to happen in the past and, and not necessarily uh, still a current focus. And I mean, you've been in this space for more than 20 years. How real, I mean, we, we aspire for something and then we ha have to think about how realistic it is in terms of quote unquote, eliminating, eliminating shortages versus minimizing the impact. What, is, what does the future look like there in terms of how you think we're going to really address them? So that's, that's a great question. And, and they, again, you know, taking the long view of, of looking at this problem for, for so long, um, you know, for probably for the first nine to 10 years of, of drug shortage work, we didn't honestly know some of the true causes for, for many of the shortages because FDA hadn't revealed that information. Um, we know much more about um, how most shortages are caused by, um, uh, you know, e economic issues, but, but mostly quality problems. And so the quality problems are something that, that can actually be targeted and, and worked on. And what I see right now is a lot of effort focusing on, on fixing those quality problems. And so I think that is, it, it's, a good, it's a good time for, for this type of progress. Um, you know, COVID has actually brought to light um, some of the limitations of our whole medication supply chain. And so uh, with, with more and more, um, you know, lawmakers interested and just people in general interested, um, I, I think uh, that the time is right for some change. So it's exciting. Um, you know, I think one of the things that excites me is um, just the attention that, that certain topics are getting, uh, that in the past it used to be really hard to get people interested in thinking about shortages. It used to be hard to get people interested in thinking about where our medications come from, where the raw materials come from. It's really wonky and really kind of detail-oriented, and it's, it's so hard to get people interested in that. But People are interested now. And so, so that excites me. That's so true. I find myself as well. Like, I know when we talk, we get excited about talking about the, the, these uh, topics, but now it seems like it's across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about, everyone wants to understand the supply chain. What does that ultimately mean? Um, and not just those on the front lines. And even those on the front lines, you find that they've had to educate themselves within the, pharma the pharmaceutical supply chain on a different level in terms of figuring out where to have an impact. So that's exciting in the sense that our, uh, the, these topic areas are you know, we're talking about them, although you've over the years too made several media appearances and it seems like drug shortages appear in the news almost daily. But, you know, do you find a different sense of urgency now versus before when you're, when we're talking about this issue? I, I do. So, um, you know, thinking back to maybe 10 years ago, um, the media would only get excited about a shortage if we could really point to a patient that was harmed, you know. Uh, I would talk to reporters, I would say, what's going on? I would tell them about a shortage, tell them about how we're trying to manage things uh, in, in the hospital and how problematic it was. And they, well, you know, my editor is gonna wanna see a patient uh, that's been harmed. And, and I guess that's, you know, that's, that's the media. But um, now um, people, people are much more interested in, in uh, thinking about our supply chain. So I think, um, you know, the unfortunate events with Hurricane Maria began a little bit of, of that with, with Puerto Rico and their manufacturing sectors being affected. Um, I remember um, former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb coming out and, and telling people that he was, you know, worried about this, this long list of drugs. And literally every reporter that I'd ever talked to was texting me, calling me, emailing me, uh, saying, what's the list? What's the list? And, and, you know, you just have to keep explaining over and over that, 
uh, many parts of our supply chain are opaque and we don't always get to know uh, which manufacturer makes uh, a medicine and where it's made and which factory site. Um, not, none of that is really um, available on, on a transparent and, and public way. And so now with COVID, certainly I got the same thing, you know, um, early in February, our chief medical officer called me up and said, Aaron, we, we got to get the list of everything that's made in China right now <laughs> and, and buy up. And so I'm trying to explain, you know, we're not going to hoard and, um, you know, that just, just, just those, those details are, are really, uh, kind of interesting to think about. What obstacles or challenges keep you up at night? Drug shortages, uh, <laughs> they just, <laughs> they, they do. And, you know, with, with COVID, um, it has been particularly challenging. So, um, you know, here at our health system, very, very early on, um, when we didn't we didn't know what was coming coming at us, um, I actually asked our uh, chief medical officer, who was having uh, meetings about crisis standards of care with with our state of Utah. I asked him to make sure that medications were a component there because. You know, I, I could see if we were going to, you know, quadruple the number of, of ICU patients that, that we needed to take care of. We didn't have enough medicine for, for that. And um, we were going to need to figure out rationing strategies. And so um, certainly had some sleepless nights about that. Um, you know, parents will call me when, when their children are affected by a drug shortage and um, you know, some, some of those, some of those keep, keep me up at night as, as well. Um, so with just for, um, our at attendees in terms of a little bit of context on drug shortages, when we talk about drug shortage, because, uh, myself, you and myself are, but we're both based in the United States. And when we talk about drug shortages, when you're mentioning drug shortages, are you mentioning it more of a United States problem, a global problem? Uh, can you give the attendees just a little bit more context in terms of what is this situation of drug shortages that we're talking about? And are is the US different than maybe other countries or how, what does that, yeah, what does absolutely. that look like? So, you know, um, drug shortages are definitely a global problem, uh, especially with global manufacturing. Um, many of the products that, that we need are maybe made only in one or two places in the world or the, the API, the raw materials for, for, for those medicines. Um, and so drug shortages can happen anywhere in, in the world. Um, I'm most familiar with um, kind of parallel efforts that are going on in Europe. Um, so last year I had the opportunity to uh, travel to Belgium and uh, be part of a, a, a global conference. Uh, so we actually had folks there from South America, um, almost from every uh, nation in the EU was was represented there, and I was representing the the United States. And so um, it was very, very interesting for me to learn about uh, drug shortages and and how they they were um, slightly different than than in the United States. In the United States, most of the shortages are problems where you can't get a specific formulation, like a specific strength or a vial size. It's pretty rare that we are a hundred percent out of something. Um, but, in Europe, because of the way that they do their purchasing through their tendering process, um, even if a, another generic product is met, might be available to them, if their country hasn't negotiated a contract for that product, they may have a more difficult time accessing it. And so some of their shortages may actually be a little bit more severe than, than in the US. However, because they have national healthcare systems there, uh, they have an, a much easier time managing shortages than we do in the U.S. So in the United States, it's hospital by hospital, and everyone has a, a different electronic health record. Um, it was most interesting for me to, to hear from the folks at, at Leuven, where we were at in, in Belgium, and they uh, talked about how they have a committee, and they push out one change to all hospitals in Belgium. And that's the shortage management plan. And I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, but, you know, of course, it's such a, it's much smaller scale than, than the U.S. But, um, you know, unfortunately, drug shortages are, are a bit of a global problem. And um, part of that is, you know, if we can work on fixing some of the quality issues at these factories, then that helps the situation for, for all countries. 
And the pandemic now has truly disrupted supply chains across not just in healthcare, kind of across the board. And as a result, various initiatives within various sectors uh, have emerged as, as a result of the disruptions in the pandemic and the, the situation that we have on hand. Um, what current new initiatives uh, emerge as a result of the pandemic that you've seen that can positively influence um, and address some of these challenges that we, we've already talked about or others? So I think one of the, um, one of the great um, silver linings of, of this pandemic is um, how quickly we can make decisions and work together. And so um, I personally had the opportunity to work um, very quickly and rapidly with our, our uh, physician leaders to um, put together use guidelines and, and plans. And it is amazing, um, you know, in an academic medical center, things usually take a, a while to, to make changes. And um, it is amazing how, how quickly that can shift uh, in an emergency situation. And um, everyone is really a little bit excited about it, you know, where in the past it, it might be um, difficult maybe to get some physicians interested in medication use policy work. They'd be like, no, no I, don't, I don't have time for that committee. I don't have time for eight committee meetings. Well, we can have a phone call and, and decide in that one hour what, what will happen. And so I think that that collegiality and um, just the increased need for speed, but um, just the recognition that we can move a little bit more quickly has actually um, been, been really fun. Uh, uh, actually, you know, as, as as terrible as as things are, um, I will say that that part of it has has been very very fun for me. You stated that you may think of advocacy as a discrete event, a simple letter to write, or a specific vote to get out. Instead, I'd like you to think about the long view, an advocacy journey marked by personal commitment and perseverance, taken one step at a time. So, what are your thoughts on building on that about advocacy and how we can um, group both leadership and advocacy together. Advocacy is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. So, so thank you for, for pulling that, that quote out. Um, you know, I think, I think not everyone realizes um, how, how essential advocacy is, especially to professional pharmacy, but it can be really essential to anyone in healthcare. Um, to, to, if, you, if you care about your patients, um, you, you have an obligation to, to advocate for them. And, and I would argue that if you read the oath of a pharmacist, uh, you will find elements in there that really say, everyone should be an advocate for your patient and, and that's advocacy. And I think some people are frustrated with advocacy because it can seem like making changes um, is very difficult and, and it is, and, and it's baby steps along the way. And that's why I talk about perseverance. You know, you've got to stick with it. Um, yes, you may have a very lofty goal at the, at the end, which, you know, for me is to eliminate drug shortages, but, you know, we can't legislate our way there. And there are a lot of steps all along the way that to be accomplished in, in order to make progress. And so um, I love talking with, with students and, and residents about this as well, because it's, it, 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 to me, it is, it is part of your professional commitment. If, if you are signing on to be a pharmacist, you need to be an advocate for your patients and that means advocating for change. So um, yeah, go do it. Of the work that, we, uh, that uh, you've moved forward in terms of drug shortages and putting to light various advocacy issues, I think it's very important as a leader to, um, and to influence those in terms of those seeking kind of these insights and experiences to understand that, you know, if you do have a passion area that you're working towards, you can build a career in that area because it, there's always these challenges, like you mentioned, that need to be solved. And even within the same one, things are constantly adapting and changing, right? The supply chain Absolutely. looks very different now than what it was five, 10 years ago. Um, the issue in the United States looked maybe very different 10 years ago than it does, or maybe not so in terms of whatever challenges that you have. So things are constantly adapting. And when you kind of have those areas, and then you build upon that. And I feel like a lot of uh, your career has with the advocacy work has kind of built upon that, like, how are you creating those steps towards change in various different ways, right. And I think every leader does that a little differently. You speak extensively to people that aren't pharmacists, so that people that 
not might not understand the issue at hand or that are still within the healthcare space, but you're trying to deliver a message across disciplines. So now if we're, because also our attendees, not all of them are pharmacists or even within healthcare, they're definitely not always speaking to those within their own discipline. What advice would you give as as others are trying to communicate across disciplines, across sectors? Such a great question. I think about uh, methods of communication all the time. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the pitfalls that I see people make is not thinking about the message before saying it. So um, it's, it's worth uh, that pause uh, to consider what is the message that, that you want to communicate. Um, and have you made it concise? Have you made it short? Um, I, uh, you know, people aren't going to read long emails. Um, people aren't going to listen to to a very lengthy explanation. Uh, think about distilling your message down to to a few key points. Um, people can always follow up and ask you some some additional details. But um, I love. I mean, there's a variety of different ways to do this. But I love uh, thinking about it in that SBAR format. Um, or just, just it can really help you distill down your ideas. So, um, you know, whenever someone uh, might have me proof uh, an email that, that they want to send out, um, nine times out of 10, I recommend um, deleting half of it. And just, if you have a clear and concise message, um, it's, it will be understood by more people and, and be able to, especially if you're asking other people to carry forth that message to even more people, um, Having, having things as tight and, and concise as possible is, um, is my recommendation. So we've talked about big topics actually that can be quite frustrating like drug shortages and kind of the, all the disruptions that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic. But as, as, as I'm speaking to you, I'm even more positive that through specific action, no matter how big or small, we can truly make a positive impact in the various different areas that we're focused on be it drug shortage, be it in pharmacy, be it in healthcare, and even beyond across our communities. So I think that's a definitely a, a theme that I'm taking home in terms of sure. taking that those small steps, saying those yeses um, to make that positive impact 